Hey, everybody, welcome to another edition of The Drop. Greg Wyshynski, Ardo Cal here with you twice weekly on Tuesdays and Thursdays, wherever you get your audio podcasts as well, the NHL on ESPN YouTube. The first thing I'd like to do, Wish, is I would like to thank the hockey gods for giving us the big news of the day before we record the podcast. Thank you, hockey gods. You did us a solid. You gave us the Willie Nylander news before we hit record. We didn't have to scrap a previous edition of the podcast. Everything is awesome. Wish I'm so happy right now. I know. No, no, no drop ins from future Greg and future Arda talking about something that happened uh, hours after we closed the show. No, man, it was great. We were going to talk about it anyway, because it seemed like it was trending in that direction, regardless uh, with Willie Nylander signing the eight year deal worth 11.5 million against the cap, which starts next season, full no move clause all the way through. It was trending that way. It was going to end up that way. And all of the various Canadian insiders were telling us, oh, expect the contract to be done by today or tomorrow. So we were pretty sure we were going to be able to talk about it, but it is nice to have it signed, sealed and delivered. And that uh, Willie Style will be a leaf in uh, perpetuity, Arda. Your Canadian impression uh, is very South Park. How, how nice of you. It's, it rivals. It's like oh, on par with South Park. It's oh, bring, par. bring the kids in from the pond. Oh, Give them hot gosh. cocoa. Willie Nylander's hey, a leaf. Hey, buddy. Um, so the particulars, as Wish said, eight years, 11.5 AAV. It is the richest contract in Leafs history. Remember, Austin Matthews signed a four-year contract. It's a higher AAV. But overall, in total, Willie Nylander takes the cake. A couple of notes. Obviously, a very top-heavy team. Matthews is at 13.25. Marner's at 10.5. Tavares is at 11 right now. The cap is going up about $4 million next year to 87.7. With all of that information, Wish, your initial reaction to Willie Nylander and the size and magnitude of this contract. Well, first off, I will caution anyone expecting the cap to go up as one of the reasons why this deal is good. Ask Kyle Dubas about expecting the cap to continue to go up when he signed all these kids, those big contracts, and then COVID happened and changed everybody's perception of those deals. Look, this deal is slightly above where David Pasternak ended up last year at the Boston Bruins. That's to be expected. Look, you know, Willie Nylander is fourth in the NHL in points per game as we do this podcast. The man is a star. Like the last two seasons for Nylander, he has arrived on the scene as a star player. Um, and the Leafs, frankly, had the same problem that the Bruins had last year with Pasternak, where the Bo Boston and Pasternak camp were grinding away at a number all season long. And then the goals kept coming and kept coming and kept coming and then ended up at 61. So all of a sudden, the math changed dramatically on Pasternak's deal from the beginning of the season to the end of the season. And he wound up signing a contract in March. So no doubt Nylander's number was adjusted a little bit thanks to the incredible career year he's having this season. Listen, I... You got to pay your stars. I think this is market value for the Leafs. No discount whatsoever. The only thing I hate, obviously, is the no move clause throughout the entire deal. I, I, it just, you know, when you look down the road at injuries or decline or anything like that, you're stuck with them. But that's coin of the realm right now in trying to sign a young player to a long term deal. So you got to do it. But that's the only problem I have with it. I think Nylander is a tremendous. By the way, Arda, on a team that does, is not known for playoff performance, one of the few guys that has come through for them in the postseason. The one thing I also want to say is we are almost in unprecedented territory with the Toronto Maple Leafs franchise because there's plenty of examples of superstar players not necessarily wanting to play in the city of Toronto. And now you have an overabundance of top heavy players, of high contract players, of superstar players that want to play together in the city of yeah. Toronto, but that leads us to the elephant in the room wish. This is a very top heavy team. Financially, there's going to have to be some concessions made in the off season. And we're going to have to look top to bottom to see overall, if this is a Stanley cup contending team with all of the superstars on top, uh, eating tens of millions of dollars of that cap space. So what say you about the fact that top heavy teams, even having any sort of run, towards the Stanley Cup as it pertains to the Toronto Maple Leafs? Well, being a, co a top-heavy team is a long-term problem. I mean, I, I, I think what we're seeing now in Tampa is the best example of it, where, you know, they were dedicating a great chunk of salary to a certain amount of players. 
They won a couple Stanley Cups. But then as time goes on, you see the atrophy in the lineup. You see the entire checking line have to go and two top six forwards and your second best defenseman. And, and so keeping your team together to me is the real challenge. You can win a cup with a top heavy team, I think. Uh, but keeping that team together is the real challenge. But look, the thing about the Leafs, and it's kind of crazy, is for all this talk about the percentage of the cap that Matthews is getting and that Nylander is getting, and that Marner is getting now and could get again, uh, and that Riley is getting, they've got an uh, amazing amount of cap flexibility, Arda. Like, they only have 12 players under contract for next season. Uh, Tavares comes off the cap in two years. Uh, if he wants to remain a Toronto Maple Leaf, it is going to be at a team discount. It is certainly not going to be at the uh, at the cap that he's at now, which is like 11 million. OK, Marner comes off the cap in 2025 along with Tavares. Now, I'm not saying that the Leafs aren't going to re-sign Mitch Marner. They like him a lot. He does some things that Nylander doesn't do, like defend. That being said, if the Leafs find another postseason in which they do not find success, this team will have the flexibility to reshape its roster. This team will have the flexibility to take Nylander and Matthews and Riley and make that your core and then build how you see fit around them. So for all this talk about the Nylander deal kind of being an albatross for this Leafs team, they've got a surprising amount of outs if they want to take them in trying to go in a different direction if they don't like the way things are going in the postseason. To your point, Tyler Bertuzzi, five and a half million. These are all UFAs at the end of this season. Tyler Bertuzzi, five and a half million. Max Domi, three million. Uh, TJ Brody, five million. Mark Giordano, 800K. Uh, <laughs> and uh, looking at right. Uh, yeah, they, they lose like half their D. John in the Klingberg, 4.15 yeah. million. Matt Murray, 4.68 million. So yeah, look, to your point, there are a lot of multi million dollar contracts that are but up at the end of the year. But the real key is, though, Arda, is that like these teams that were able to be top heavy and then win with a lot, a few players earning the most money, they've all been able to do it by having a supporting cast that is by and large homegrown. And this is my concern for the Leafs. It's like if they're going to pay Nylander, they've paid Matthews, if they run it back with Marner and pay him, you know, and they have Riley still on the deal, like there's a there's like huge percentage of the cap that is being dedicated to these players. The way you get around that is by having young, cheap labor. The problem for the Leafs is, according to the Athletics Pipeline rankings for this season, they have the 27th best farm system right now. You know, they've had to trade away draft picks. They've not had great draft position because of their success in the regular season. It all adds up to where does this supporting cast come from? Do they have enough people coming through the Marlies and down the system to supplant the top tier players making that much money? Or do they have to go outside the organization to find cheap labor? That part's not impossible. You could do it. No, it just becomes a little bit harder when you're not having your guys come through the development pipeline that say like the Penguins and the Lightning did when their star players were making a good a chunk of change in those cup years. I'm going to print the shirts now. The Hilda Beast. <laughs> Let's get them out there now. Uh, by the way, this is also Brad Treliving's highest valued contract in his general manager career. He also signed the uh, Jonathan Huberto contract at eight times ten and a half, uh, which yeah. came close. But which, which again, again, Arda. Cautionary tales do abound for a contract like this for, for Nylander. I mean, you look at Huberto, that's perhaps the greatest one. I think change in scenery for him has been a problem, but that's a deal that was signed and and now it looks bad. Jamie Benn signed a very similar kind of percentage of the cap deal with the Dallas Stars back in the day. For a couple of years, it looked great. Now it's one they maybe wish they could get out of, even though he's an effective player, but not living up to the contract cap hit. So again, decline in stats, health of a player there's always a chance they're gonna look back on this and be like "Ugh, what a what a contract if mm -hmm. only that it had didn't have a no move clause on it but i think overall again you want to sign your star players you yes. want to sign players that want to be there and uh you can either be the leafs that go all in on your high-end talent in the hopes that they can break through or you could be say like the carolina hurricanes and have a really good team that is thrifty and economical but unable to score that critical goal in the postseason to get them over the top Speaking of massive numbers, that's exactly what we saw in the Professional Women's Hockey League in their inaugural week. Here to break it all down, Haley Salvian. 
A big week for women's hockey. The turn of the calendar to 2024 also brought forth the debut of the Professional Women's Hockey League. Two attendance records in professional women's hockey history already broken uh, very early on. Over 8,300 fans in Ottawa and then the state of hockey, Minnesota, north of 13,000 and 2.9 million Canadian viewers on New Year's Day alone. Here to break it all down is women's hockey writer, NHL writer, co-host of the Athletic Podcast and Athletic writer Haley Salvian to break this all down for us. Haley, first of all, thanks for joining us on The Drop. We love your work. We appreciate mm-hmm. you. We appreciate you being on with us. Uh, and let's just let's just talk about the week overall. How what were the sequences of events and like the perfect storm that created such a great debut for the PWHL? Yeah, well, thanks for having me. I appreciate that. When you're reading the intro, I'm like, I, do I do too much stuff? I'm feeling a little <laughs> tired. I should, you know, be kinder to other podcasts and radio hosts. They don't have to list as many things. But thanks. I'm I'm happy to be here. And I think there was when you talk about the perfect storm, like that's kind of what happened here, right? And the lead up to this uh, first season. I mean, I think a big thing for for the debut of this league has just been kind of the anticipation on, on many fronts, right? Like if you're a women's hockey fan, who's been wanting to see like a Mary Philippe Poulin or a Sarah nurse play pro women's hockey, you haven't been able to do that for four years. So there's a lot of excitement for seeing players like that, take the ice, not wearing team Canada or team USA jerseys. Right. And I think there was a lot of excitement for uh, fans who are coming from the premier hockey federation. They haven't seen their favorite players play in several months, right? Like we're talking about really long off seasons. We just haven't been able to see a lot of these players on a consistent way over the last several months. So I think there was excitement from whatever different group of fans we're talking about to finally see these players again. I think it's just been a ton of anticipation. I think a, a huge thing too, is just like actually having people who work for the league and work for the teams who are working on the business side and selling uh, the marketing, selling the game, selling tickets, you know, gone are the days of Hillary Knight having to hit a ticket quota to get people in the building in Boston, right? And she's making the comic that went viral. I don't know if anybody ever saw that, but there was a great ESPN piece about it um, several years ago when that happened. So I just think it's this perfect storm of of something new, all these players being on the ice and and just how different this league is you covered the canadian women's hockey league i covered the nwhl mm-hmm. when when those launched there was a lot of momentum too i mean a little yeah. bit smaller scale they weren't like packing <laughs> nhl arenas or anything yeah. like that but um but there was excitement there was interest and that interest didn't necessarily carry through the season uh sure. their inaugural season and then in season subsequent and then on mm-hmm. into the phf as well so the, the question i've been trying to figure out maybe you can help us out here is like mm-hmm. how does this league keep this momentum going through its inaugural season? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think it's like, it's an important one to have. And like, I appreciate that. Like, I understand the question. I've also seen so many people on social media be like, yeah, well, it's the first game. Like what happens in two weeks? (laughs) Um, And it's one of those things, like, of course, people are going to ask that question because as you said, Greg, like we've seen this before, right? The first ever NWHL game sold out. It was at Chelsea Piers, but I think it was more like, 700 people in the yeah. building right like we're talking about different scales and and i think some of the signs of showing that that momentum is going to continue through the opening weekend is toronto's already sold out all their home games right like if you want to get tickets for next week's game in ottawa like you're probably looking at the upper bowl like they're looking at opening more uh seats in ottawa they're opening more seats in montreal and that's week two that's week three of this league so we're already seeing that that interest is there beyond the first week i think the viewership's been there obviously the first game 2.9 million viewers on canadian tv and that didn't include the streaming numbers on different platforms youtube the american numbers so i think the hockey's really good um i think that's going to be a big reason why it sticks around i'm not saying that the hockey wasn't good in the phf or the cwhl but it's just different like you have all of these players in one spot like i can't stress enough how important that is um because what's been the problem with all those leagues is like everything's been split right so all those fans who might have tuned in for the NWHL 
first game might have said, okay, like I watched it. This is great. But like Nat Spooner's on the Fury. So I'm going to go back to watching the CWHL. Right. And now that our CWHL fans are going to say, well, like I really like Madison Packer. We're not going to see that anymore. All those people are going to be in one place. And I think that's so critical for the growth and success of women's hockey at the pro level. So I think what's really exciting actually is I think the hockey is just going to continue to get better. Like, all these teams are going to take some time to click at all cylinders. And, and once that happens, like the product's going to improve, the games are going to get better. And I think the eyeballs are going to stick around and, and do better for it too. I mean, so new, they don't even have names yet, Haley. That's how <laughs> yeah. new we're talking yeah. about. Here these yeah. Names. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, People keep, I... don't ask me about it, Greg. I'm so tired. I'm so tired. <laughs> that that, that <laughs> is a question questions. we can certainly put to rest. Um, yeah. here's, here's my segue question, because we do want to ask you a couple of NHL questions. The NHL mm -hmm. has been pretty vocal about their stance on supporting women's hockey. They wanted one yeah. league. They were waiting for one league, and now there's one league. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's going to be a PWHL presence at the All-Star game uh, as part of the All-Star festivities. Here's my question, though. What, in your opinion, if anything, what should a symbiotic relationship between the PWHL and NHL look like? When the Canadian Women's Hockey League launched, like their whole goal, like their whole business plan was to like, let's just do enough that we can grow the game and show that people care. So then the NHL can just take it over and make a WNHL. Like we want to just be a vessel to become the WNBA one day. And that was their whole plan. And that was for a really long time what people thought women's hockey would look like. But obviously with Mark Walter, this is a single entity ownership um, structure for this league. The N this is not the NHL's business. And I, I actually really appreciate the fact that this league has a group of business people who are saying like, we will take your support, Gary Bettman and Bill Daly and people in the NHL. But like, we can do this on our own. Like, this is our own thing. This is not the NHL cutting a bunch of checks, trying to make it work. Um, so I think that's kind of a unique and cool thing that's happened with this new league. But I think in terms of the relationship, I think we're seeing, um, you know, a pretty good one right now. Obviously, the NHL is providing a huge platform for these women at the All-Star Game with the three-on-three -three that's going to happen on the Thursday. I remember the first time they did that. Uh, in I think 2019, they did the three on three. It, it was the Canada U S and I remember like, you know, a lot of people watching being like, wow, like Alex Carpenter's sick and Anne Renee de Bien's like unbelievable. And I think the NHL is going to provide another huge platform for these women to show out. And again, that goes back to the momentum question, Greg, like people are probably going to watch that who maybe didn't watch the first game or the first week of the season and go, oh, like, yeah, yeah, Alex Carpenter's sick. Like, I'm going to go watch the New York game. Um, so I think that's a great thing with the relationship with the NHL. I think Gary Bettman's also been a really big supporter and just help of things. Like, I think they know that it's not their business. They're not running the show, but they've been there for any advice or any questions that PWHL staff have to ask. Um, I know Stan Kasten said earlier last week um, at the Ottawa game, like, that's a big reason why they have a team in Ottawa because they were looking at different original six markets and Gary Bettman said like why don't you look at Ottawa like Gary Bettman was the one pushing for wow. them to have a presence in in the nation's capital so I think that's a cool relationship I think eventually maybe we'll see a place where NHL teams are more heavily involved in local markets I wanted to ask you one thing about the league before we get I, I bug you about the mm -hmm. flames which is you know uh, one of the things I really hope happens with the professional women's hockey league is coverage of the league, coverage of the games, coverage yeah. of the athletes. It's been mm -hmm. my failing and many others failing to cover the business aspects of these leagues, totally. but not actually cover a lot of the day-to-day -day and game-to-game, -game, and especially in the playoffs. Uh, your take real quick on the landscape of these first inaugural teams. It would seem to me, based on early results, that Minnesota is pretty darn good, mm -hmm. uh, maybe one of the best goaltending batteries in all of hockey. How do you see these teams early on? Yeah, I think Minnesota is going to be great. I went into the season thinking that they were going to have a strong team. I had maybe some questions about their blue line because they have Lee Steckline, um, who, in my opinion, is like the best defensive defender in the game. She's just so hard to beat. She's a really long stick, like a very long reach. She's just incredibly annoying to try to get around. Um, she's such a disruptor in the defensive zone. As a Canadian, like she really annoys me. But as someone who appreciates <laughs> women's hockey, I think Lee Steckline's great. Um but outside of Lee, they don't have as many, you know, maybe big name players. But I think in the first few games, uh, their blue lines look pretty solid. I think their goalie tandem has looked excellent, as you said, Greg. Um, Maddie Rooney's a great story. You know, she played at 
Minnesota Duluth and she played in the PWHPA Montreal chapter and now she's a free agent signing the number two goalie in Minnesota and, and she's been kind of cut from the national team. She was the star of the 2018 Olympics. Obviously, she's the one that backstops them to, to a gold medal. Again, that sucks as a Canadian, but you know, she was such a star for, for Team USA and now she's out of the fold. And I think it's great she gets an opportunity to go and you know, get a, the first shutout for Minnesota and, and play unbelievable for her pro team. So I think that goalie tandem looks great. I think the thing I like the most about Minnesota is their one, two punch in their top six, like Taylor Heisey and Grace Sumwinkle are not on the same line. So we're talking about the first ever pick the first overall pick, you know, a stud in Taylor Heisey. Um, and then Grace Sumwinkle is, you know, your second line option. And she's the one that gets the first hat trick in league history. And, and she gets the first Hattie for, for Minnesota. And I think if you can have a top six that features those two players, like you're going to be okay, right? You've got yeah. two really solid scoring options. And then obviously, you know, casually just throw in Kendall coin Schofield to the mix, Kelly panic. Um, yeah. So they're a deep team and they're a Minnesota team too. So I think they're going to have a really specific and annoying, but fun style of play. <laughs> um, so I think they're a team to watch for sure. I still think Boston's the best team on paper. Like they're mm -hmm. just stacked, um, but they're also Funny enough, the only team without a point so far with a 3-2-1 system, um, you know, they're the only ones that didn't get a regulation win or overtime loss. So I think it's way too early to panic about something like that. The NHL, one question for you. Uh, you covered Calgary mm -hmm. for a bit. Uh, they're not doing so great. 15% yeah. chance of making the playoffs. Uh, a couple mm -hmm. names that jump off the page. Noah Hannafin, Elias Lindholm. What do you think happens with those players in that team? They're so interesting. Like, I... I personally think that they should be traded at the deadline. Um, trade Chris Tanev to like any unrestricted free agent. I think that they should take the best offer. Um, but I think what makes them so interesting is like they're only two points out of a wild card spot right now. So like we're looking at a team that they lose to the Blackhawks uh, over the weekend, a very stripped down Blackhawks roster. Oh, I might generous. add like, right. Like I'm trying to so be kind. Like an 11 I mean, million they, dollar yeah. Cap yeah they, they lost to the ice hogs, <laughs> but sure. Yeah. <laughs> Your words, not mine. They lose to, to pare down Chicago Blackhawks team over the weekend, but they're still only two points out of a wild card. So this is a team that we're looking at saying like, they've been so bad. Like what's going on over the last two years that are probably going to miss the playoffs again, but they're actually not that far out. So they're Craig Conroy's kind of in the situation of like, if we're by the deadline, we're still only two points out. Do we kind of hold these guys and hope for the best? And I think that'd be really short sighted. Um, I think this is not the Johnny Gaudreau situation from two years ago. I know you look at that and say that they still lost him in unrestricted free agency. Um, but like they were a good team that year. Like there was no question, like they were going to make the playoffs. They were going to do well in the playoffs. And I know they only won one round, but like, you don't, don't trade Johnny Gaudreau regardless of his contract situation in a year like that. But like this, it's not the same. There's no gray area. This is not a very good team. Even if they make the playoffs, they're not going to go far. And they're stuck in the mushy middle. And they're probably going to be in a situation where, you know, either they miss the playoffs or they make it and lose in the first round. And regardless, uh, they're going to pick like 13th overall in the draft again. They've been in the mushy middle for so long. And I just think the Flames almost need to like steer into the skid a little bit. Trade your unrestricted free agents, get what you can and and retool on the fly because they've been in that spot for for way too long. Even when they had really good teams like this, they just haven't been able to to win when it matters. Um, and I just, I think that those guys should be traded. Like, even if you can get Elias Lindholm on, on a fair deal, like what is that really doing for you in the long run? So I, I think that they should kind of take a step back. I know they didn't sign Nazem Kadri and Jonathan Huberto to, to rebuild, but I just, it's, it's not working. Not working. Haley, you're working. You're working a lot and you made some time to join us here on The Drop and we appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for your time. Uh, everybody read Haley's coverage of uh, the PWHL. It's awesome and we will talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Let's be honest. Y'all thought a Canadian, a Canadian could ever have the United States Championship? The United States Championship Kevin, brother, you beating me for the U.S. title is like the Canucks winning a Stanley Cup. No lies detected, Casey. It's never going to happen!
Thanks again to Haley for joining us on the show. Obviously, this is our first real official, official show of 2024. We had a couple in the can for you over the holidays. So let's play a little catch up on some news and notes throughout the most recent time span uh, that we would like to touch up on. The biggest news wish absolutely at the top logan paul disparaging the vancouver canucks <laughs> how could he the united states champion be smirching canada like that baby the best heat the best heat is cheap heat and logan paul once again shows us that uh i love it what 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 a move to take a run at the canucks like that if you're logan paul absolutely and obviously this is a commonplace thing in pro wrestling cheap heat take a shot at the city that you're in edge and christian did this very well during the attitude era i distinctly remember them doing their famous five second poses where one of them like kurt angle would be a goaltender and edge and christian would have like uh, uh hated teams jerseys on and they'd be scoring on the home team and like it was hilarious so yeah this is a tied and try tested and true method uh, that logan paul is also uh doing to a t how about something that uh, that's something we could have predicted Logan Paul doing in Vancouver? How about something we may not have predicted, especially at the start of the season? This is the Winnipeg Jets world, Greg Wyshynski, and we are just living in it. How did we get to this point, man? Well, I should say that this is predictable what the Jets are doing. If we listen to our friends in the analytics community, uh, Stathletes uh, reached out to them recently for a story and they said, hey, look. Watch these Jets because they are an elite defensive team. And lo and behold, that defense has helped them to the top of the NHL in January. Um, you know, third and expected goals against and preventing rush uh, scoring chances from opponents. Uh, they're Again, they're a great defensive team in front of arguably the best goalie in the world. So you put that together, you've got yourself a very so sound foundation to build upon. They're getting goal scoring from throughout the lineup. The one thing that they got to do are to, before the trade deadline, I think, is address that second line center spot that's been trying to be uh, solved by committee behind Mark Shifley. The loss of Dubois in the offseason obviously opened up that spot. If they can find someone to hold that down. They could be a real contender in the West. Yeah, absolutely. And and what a turnaround in terms of storyline, right? Uh, winning cures everything. We know this. But at the start of the season, which we were talking about, what's the future of players like Connor Hellebuck do they even want to play yeah, right? in Winnipeg and now look at them they're the top of the league everything is all systems go in the city of Winnipeg we're talking about um, them being the best team in hockey like that is a full 180 so you got to give them credit absolutely, absolutely. And, and and full marks to Kevin Dayoff, okay because he is the guy who decided he wasn't going to trade Shifley wasn't going to trade Hellebuck signed them both long-term deals and then made the Pierre-Luc Dubois trade with an eye towards the present versus necessarily the future I mean he goes and gets Aya follow on that trade he gets Velarde he gets it's not like a bunch of picks came back the other way from the Kings for uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois you got a bunch of players that could help them out now Maybe he saw a window that existed that we didn't see, but lo and behold, the Jets are uh, are a cup contender, no doubt about it. Winnipeg also in the news because they were accused of <laughs> intentionally trying to injure Kirill Kaprizov of the Minnesota Wild by <sighs> Michael Russo of The Athletic. Uh, Minnesota forward Ryan Hartman claimed he did not admit to an intentionally high-sticking Cole Perfetti in the face. The video clearly showed the high stick off the face-off, but he uh, knew uh, because he knew Perfetti was wearing a live mic. Uh, this is a crazy situation for multiple reasons. Uh, this has been debated at length in the hockey community. What are your thoughts? I don't I don't buy that like Brendan Dillon is trying to intentionally injure Krill Kaprizov. I don't I don't buy that. I know that he's suffered a couple of injuries against that team. I think the first one was a bit of a uh, unfortunate series of events. This one's a bit more direct, but I don't think it's a, a headhunting thing. Uh, against Kaprizov from the Jets. The Perfetti thing it, to me was it, it, one of my most favorite hilarious stories. Again, they keep the, the old ad campaign art it was no soap operas, just hockey. Well, it's all soap operas now. Okay. You literally had Ryan Hartman of the Minnesota Wild uh, saying that he did not admit to intentionally hitting Cole Perfetti in the face with a stick as retribution for the Kaprizov thing because basically because he was wearing a wire. And the thing he said to Perfetti was, I'm not going to say that it wasn't on purpose. <laughs> that not being, I did that on purpose, is some pathetically pedantic uh, defense 
from Hartman on that one. Uh, it, what a what a weird, wacky story. I still don't know if Perfetti broke kayfabe by telling the media that Hartman said this to him on the ice, but um, I, I just think Hartman was and, being a little ridiculous here. And just for the record, a lot of people are asking, well, why can't we hear the audio? That's part of the CBA from, what, like 2005? That, that would be inadmissible in situations like this, so that's yeah. why the audio hasn't been... One, one of the things I learned, by the way, is that although the audio can't be used, the the Department of Player Safety, who we're going to talk about in a second, um, they they find Hartman, but they can go back and suspend the guy after finding him. I didn't realize that. I thought if you find the guy, then it's like, what is it, like double jeopardy if you go and suspend the guy after that. But if yeah. they, you know they find a guy and they found out that like he's part of like a bounty thing, uh, they can go back and suspend him. But they clearly didn't think that this play rose to that with Hartman and the uh, accusations of retribution per from Perfetti didn't uh, sway them either way. The, the quote, I'm not going to say it wasn't on purpose, reminds me of that scene in The Simpsons with Bart and Lisa. I'm going to swing my arms like this. And if you happen, if your face happens to come in contact with my fist, it's not my fault. That's, that's what it's, it reminds me of. Uh, speaking of the Department of Player Safety, Nick Cousins was not penalized or suspended for his hit on Arizona defenseman Yusuf Valamaki, led to Sportsnet's Kevin Bieksa going off on Cousins, calling him a rat, or that's rat behavior, that's a rat move, saying that someone on the Florida Panthers should straighten him out, or the NHL has to come down and hammer this guy with his suspension, uh, like they did with Bieksa's friend, Rafi Torres. Your thoughts? I was a little harsh on Bieksa. I like Bieksa. They were, I think we're, we're okay um, on him evoking the name of Rafi Torres during this Hockey Night in Canada rant. Like, I think Nick Cousins is a cheap player, but I don't think he's Rafi Torres. And and if Bieksa's point is that the Department of Player Safety should come down on Cousins to try to change his behavior. Rafi Torres is the single worst example you could use. Okay. He was given a 21 game suspension for putting Marion Hosa on a stretcher. Okay. That should be your like come to Jesus moment for, for a guy hitting people in the head in the NHL. Instead, he then hit another guy in the head, uh, Jared Stoll of the Kings. And then he hit yet another guy in the head uh, for a 41 game suspension that all but ended his career. So the idea that, Big suspensions against repeat offenders in, in the case of Rafi Torres worked. It didn't. Um, the, th the second thing and more important thing about Nick Cousins is this. Look, again, I think he's a cheap player. I think he's a, a guy who plays on the edge and goes over it with frequency. But if you want to throw the book at Nick Cousins, you have to have a reason to throw the book at him. Okay. The reverse angle on the Valamaki hit showed that he didn't have time to adjust his approach. And the velocity of the hit on Valamaki wasn't substantial enough to warrant either a penalty or supplemental discipline from the NHL. I think the Department of Player Safety would love to suspend this guy, okay? But you have to find a reason to do it. Uh, it's the same thing with Tom Wilson. Tom Wilson was a repeat, repeat, repeat guy. He played on the edge. The Department of Player Safety would have loved to have taken a number of different ones and throw the book at him, but they had to wait until they had a reason. And then when they had a reason, they suspended him 20 games. And what kills me, Arda, is the people being like, well, Nick Cousins did this. Give him 20 games. He'll learn his lesson. Those are the same people without question who talk about the Department of Player Safety being sloppy and arbitrary and, and doing things that don't make sense. Giving him a bunch of games because of what you perceive to be repeated behavior on a play that didn't even warrant a suspension. I mean, that's the kind of inconsistency that should drive us mad, but it's the kind of inconsistency that a lot of people are calling for. Are you saying this is like you're trying to arrest a member of the mob and you can't prove it, so you get them on like a traffic violation and give them life? Yeah, yeah exactly. you got to wait until <laughs> Nick Cousins gets caught for racketeering. Uh, you, that, it, you're waiting for it. And this play, Tax evasion or something, yes. as bad as it looked, go find the reverse angle of the play, man. It's a different thing. They show the same clip over and over again. If yeah, the camera cutting definitely. quickly and it looks like he's hitting him in the head, go find the longer play and then tell me if you if you see that play the same way that you saw it on the first clip. Something tells me this is not the last time we will be talking about this on this show. I wish this was the last time we were talking about this on this show. Uh, congratulations, Wish. Team USA wins the World Juniors. Go ahead. That's right, baby. USA exceptionalism continues. Uh, so proud of the red, white, and blue for winning World Junior Gold. Uh, it will then lead into 2025 when we win the fake, the fake uh, World Cup and then 2026 the when we win Olympic Gold. Cup. Uh, but again, the, we're going to have Isaac Howard on later this week to hopefully to talk about World Juniors and the U.S. winning. And most importantly, Arda, to talk about the boys winning a year's supply 
of Chipotle for their championship. Imagine I, that. That that would be incredible. Last item, and this will lead to a sponsorship opportunity <laughs> collaboration that I cannot believe has not already happened. America, North America, is obsessed with another kind of Stanley Cup. Uh, this was released on December 31st as part of Target's Galentine's Collection, a Cosmo Pink and Target Red tumbler made by Stanley, the brand that creates uh, mugs, travel mugs, etc. It quickly sold out online and in stores. The demand is extremely high. A recent video showing a crowd of people rushing to get the cups off a display shelf at Target went viral on TikTok. The big news to me here, since the Stanley brand of travel mugs is in the zeitgeist right now we don't have a stanley cup stanley cup collaboration <laughs> wish what are we even doing here i had so many texts from friends that aren't hockey fans telling me that they were seeing all this stanley cup coverage and being extremely confused on my behalf so i think what we have to do arda is we have to try for a cultural reasons to draw a a line of delineation between the Stanley Cup and the Stanley lowercase cup. For example, you can't put a baby inside the Stanley lowercase cup. It would be have to be a very, very small baby. But you can put a baby in the real Stanley Cup, as we've seen time and time again. For example, Arda, the Stanley lowercase cup does not have white gloved handlers with bowl haircuts protecting it at all costs when it's put inside of a gentleman's club. Mm, uh -huh. I mean, the, the, the Stanley lowercase cup does not have that at mm -hmm. last check. Mm -mm. There's no keeper of the Stanley mug. No, or the I don't believe so. Got it. Okay, I don't yeah, okay. so. understood. And then finally, of course, there's only one Stanley cup that Toronto will raise this year. We're not going to mention which one it is. You you had to go there, didn't you? You, had to. you you could have said there's only one Stanley Cup a Canadian team will raise this year, I guess. And Leafs, we can always make that joke. But seriously, imagine a Stanley Cup molded mug with okay. a handle and mm -hmm. a straw on top, and that's your mug. Tell me that's not flying off the shelves just like this collaboration did at Target. Would you have to call it the Stanley Cup Stanley Cup? Yes. Or would you just call it the Stanley Cup? The Stanley Cup, Stanley Cup. You got to say it twice. I like it. The SC, Introducing SC. the Stanley right. Cup, Stanley Cup. And we introduced the SC, SC on SC, Sports Center. There you go. <laughs> Done. See? Marketing department, I'm available for all of your ideas and creative meetings, okay? I can't. I, and, I mean, this is a great idea until Stanley pays, like, an exorbitant amount of money. And then they actually skate the Stanley Cup, Stanley Cup, instead of the Stanley Cup after winning the championship. Because it's like a twenty million dollar endorsement deal. Yes, and and they send them to the players. That's it, just like the WWE sends like the championship belt whenever a team wins a championship. <laughs> Stanley Cup champions get Stanley Cup, Stanley Cups. Oh, we're going down the rabbit hole now. Here you go. Si uh, so hire this man. <laughs> feel free to send us your Stanley Cup, Stanley Cup photoshops on social media. Uh, but that'll do it for us here on the drop. We are back on Thursday. Isaac Howard of Team USA World Junior Gold Fame will be joining us as Wish mentioned. But in the meantime and in between time, thank you very much for listening to our show, whether you found us on audio form or at the NHL ESPN YouTube. We will catch you on Thursday. Bye.